this is Melissa Hale, Spencer, the editor of the Altamont Enterprise, here today with an author, Carol Calaro, who has written a memoir, My Father's Daughter, and we're going to start with Carol reading a passage from that book. Hi, Melissa. Uh, yeah, this is just something that happened, uh, one of the many things that happened when I was growing up, and it has to do with my brother. Um, one day when mom was upstairs cleaning, my brother had a little accident that could have ended very badly. Mom had a bedroom window open, and she kept going back to it to shake out her dust mop. Brandon was wandering around looking for something to get into, and he climbed on top of the radiator that was in front of that window. Quicker than a flash, out he went. There was a concrete sidewalk down there covered by about two inches of snow, certainly not enough to afford any cushioning. Mom stood in the middle of the room, frozen. She couldn't even bring herself to go to the window. There was no crying coming from outside, and I flew down the stairs and threw the front door wide open, about to run to my brother. But there he stood on the porch, unshaken, unperturbed. Mom was still upstairs, completely silent, as Brandon asked me if I would make him a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. <laughs> And that is such a typical passage of this book because you have almost two streams going through it. You have kind of a slice of Norman Rockwell America, small town life, mm -hmm. and then you also have a troubling stream um, about your mother. And I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you decided to write the book. Okay. Um, actually, I didn't decide to write a book. I think the book decided to be written. Um, I made a discovery last year that upset me a great deal. And in trying to deal with that, I started writing notes to myself. Uh, I was thinking about my childhood, the things that we did, how I grew up, um, and I just, sometimes I would be up all night crying and writing. And as you can see, it still upsets me. <laughs> yes. Um, so after about two weeks of that, I was exhausted, and I put it all away. And I just let it sit. And about a month later, I decided to take it out again and start working on it a little bit. And um, as I read through it, I took the notes and I tried to put them in some kind of order so that they made sense. And I said, you know, this makes a good story. Maybe, maybe even a good book. So from there, I started to expand it and go into um, other, other parts of my life. Um, but that's how it all got started. Yes, well, we're going to dive right in <laughs> okay. to the discovery which would shake anyone to the core and it's so strange because just a few weeks ago I did a podcast with a genealogist mm -hmm. and she said you've got to be careful if you're doing ancestry.com or if you're you know doing any kind of DNA work because you can discover family secrets mm -hmm. and when she said it I just thought uh. but when I read your book I felt it to the core. Mm -hmm. So are you able emotionally to tell us about your discovery? Sure. Okay. Um, I had been working on Ancestry.com for a couple of years, and I was really good at doing research on their site. Um, I built a big uh, family tree for my own family, one for my husband's family, my current husband. Um, and one of my sisters, I have five younger siblings, uh, one of my sisters had submitted her DNA sample, and so had I, quite a while before. And she came back as my first cousin. And I laughed about it. I, I guess I didn't realize how accurate these things are. So I put it away, and I didn't think about it for a long time, never even paid any attention to it. Uh, and then one day I found out about a piece of information that's on the Ancestry.com website that I had not discovered previously. Um, there's a, a measure of DNA called centimorgans, and I don't scientifically understand them, but they, they give you more detailed information about how you're related to somebody. So I decided to go back and look at my match with my sister again, and the centimorgan count said that we were half-siblings. So I 
dug deeper and realized that on the long list of matches that they give you, I had four cousins that my sister did not. So I started researching those names. None of them were familiar to me. And I came up with a common last name for those four people and then was able to trace them back to a common ancestor and finally figured out that that was very possibly my my father. Um, I was 71 years old. I had never, ever had any clue. Well, what's interesting is the book starts by saying you knew from when you were a teenager because you knew your birthday mm -hmm. and you knew your parents' anniversary. So you knew that your mother was pregnant when she got married. That's correct. And that seemed like quite an eye-opening opening for a book <laughs> because it automatically put your father kind of in the role of hero, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And in a small town, America, just after World War II, it's so different than today. Absolutely. It's my era, exactly. Mm -hmm. my, pa my father came home from World War II and married my mother. Um, and it's just hard, I think, for modern readers or listeners to understand um, what a social taboo it was to be pregnant and mm -hmm. unmarried. Mm -hmm. But then at the end of the book, to realize that not only had your father married your mother pregnant, that she was pregnant with another man's child, and beyond that, that he knew it was another man's yeah, child. Yeah, he knew the day I was born. Yeah, and that that was kept from you your entire life. Mm -hmm. And it made me feel like rereading the book when I got to the end, which is why I <laughs> talked Carol into telling this revealing fact first, because that passage that you read at the opening of this podcast is very typical of many experiences that you portray in the book where your mother um you you almost were like a mother to your children or to her children in yeah. some way as uh, the yeah. older sister mm -hmm. and not just you know seeing who fell out the window which is very dramatic and you can imagine any mother for you seeing but things like helping your much younger sister get ready for a dance mm -hmm. and your mother saying a very derogatory thing about it, where you were there braiding her hair or fixing her up and sort of providing the love. Mm -hmm. And after I read this, it made me rethink the things I had read about your mother. Mm -hmm. Did it make you rethink the things you had felt about your mother? Well, I, I rethought things a million times. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and at the end of the book, I start to talk a little bit about realizing maybe some of the reasons my mother did some of the things she did, um, because I never thought about those things before. I, I didn't know about my dad, uh, that he wasn't my father, and so I just always thought that my mother was a nasty, hateful, spiteful person, um, but now I know that there's probably something else that um, intertwines itself into that. And that's this terrible secret that she had to try to keep from from me, from her family. I don't think her family knew. Even though I was born five, five months after they got married, I, I, certainly they must have suspected. But that back then, as you said, people didn't talk about that stuff. Mm -hmm. They just kind of put it on a shelf and shut the door. Um, I don't think my mother's family ever knew, but my father's family all knew. And I found that out from my dad's brother, who's still alive. That yeah, they... well, tell us about that scene in the book. You drive up to tell them, thinking yes. you're going to be surprising them. and Yes, they're, uh, they're both in their mid-90s. Um, he's the only surviving brother. My dad and the younger brother both died from ALS. Um, and this this uncle I never really knew very well when I was growing up because my mother didn't allow us to spend any time with my dad's brothers or their their wives or my cousins. And that might be because she knew they knew the exactly, secret. Exactly, exactly. Um, so uh, after I made my discovery and was sure of it, I was sure of it, by the way, because um, through Ancestry.com, I was able to get in touch with some of this man's um, 
descendants and eventually got in touch with a half-sister um, who I've met, and she's really sweet. I like her a lot. She sent her DNA sample in so that I could have confirmation. And, of course, she's my half-sister. So anyhow, after I knew for sure, I decided I would go down and tell my aunt and uncle. And I was really worried on the way down how they would take the news. Would they scoff at me? Would they laugh it off? Would they be angry? Would they be upset? And they weren't surprised at all. And they told me that they had always known. My grandmother knew. Um, and that was just as big a shock to me as finding out that dad wasn't my father. Um, so, And she was such an important figure in your life. Just tell us a little about your grandmother. I love the way you write about her in the book. She oh, grandma, yeah. Uh, our, uh, our backyard's kind of connected. Not exactly. They didn't line up quite right, but they kind of connected, and we were able to walk through the backyards and get over to grandma's house and my sister Patty and I. Patty was only 14 months younger than me, so we were together all the time. And um, we would sneak over to grandma's sometimes so we could get cookies out of the cookie jar. Uh, but we loved going over there. And grandma was this big old uh, half Dutch, half German woman. And she was always in the kitchen. She always had an apron on. Um, and she was always cooking and baking. And she taught me a lot about baking. She taught dad a lot about baking. He used to love to bake. Um, so, yeah, there were always wonderful smells in Grandma's kitchen, and I talk about her big old cast iron stove uh, and that, you know, you could see the fire inside, which I always thought was kind of neat. Um, no indoor plumbing in Grandma's house uh, until later, later on, much later, uh, she did get indoor plumbing. But, um, yeah, it was just a fun, warm, happy place to go. Well, just the way you describe... The town that you grew up in, a small town on the Hudson that mm -hmm. isn't named in the book, mm -hmm. and it it just seems in some ways like the quintessential American life, you know, the kinds of adventures you have, even like when you're hurt sledding, it, it's still sort of like a rough and tumble childhood, but one where you're well loved, mm -hmm. and even like the way you describe your vacations and this kind of beat up old trailer, yeah. and um but then there's this current going through it. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes in the early days that you describe, it seems like your mother is what you'd expect of a mother. You are maybe singing a solo of a second verse of a Christmas oh, yeah, carol, yeah. which mm -hmm. also wasn't named, and her smile kind of carries you through. Mm -hmm. But then you get these little hints, or beyond hints, like the, the passage that you read us at the opening. Mm -hmm. And just how you navigated that as a child is interesting to me. You were an adult before your time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I tried always to model myself after dad. I knew I didn't want to be like her. Um, I wasn't always successful. <laughs> um, but I think that's kind of what got me through um, was just knowing how dad would react to situations. And he just always did the right thing. Um, it was that simple. He, um, he was very good and very honest um, and very easy to get along with. Uh, and you make a point, there's one passage, I mark some of these, but it, it's about how he never had to physically punish you. What the, <laughs> it was just that you wanted to please him so much. Mm -hmm. You didn't want a disappointment. To appoint him, so like the worst punishment would be that he felt disappointed. In Absolutely, you, which just yep. speaks volumes about yep. your relationship. He would he would take us upstairs and set us on the bed and close the door, and proceed to make us feel terrible, <laughs> <laughs> uh, just by telling us you know why we were wrong and how it could have affected other people or or ourselves. Um, well, another stunning thread is just his extreme devotion to your mother. In the some of the, like the teenage years where you're suspecting, I think you call him a yokel, local police chief. <laughs> yeah. You know, your mother is flirtatious with him, mm -hmm. and you don't see why your father doesn't get angry. And he'll say, "Oh, she has green eyes." You yeah, know, meaning she's and lets it go. And then she 
ends up with multiple sclerosis mm-hmm. and he becomes her nursemaid exactly. for years, but never seems to resent it or to uh, bristle at it. How, how do you dis- explain or describe the, the relationship between the, those two? That's one thing that I truly don't understand. Um, Dad never seemed to think, uh, never seemed to see any of the things that my mother did, whether they were to somebody else or to him. Um, she just plain was not nice. And he, he somehow just let it all float away like it never happened. It was infuriate, infuriating as a child um, because we would get so angry with her and he would just say, uh, let it go. Don't make your mother angry. Um, don't rock the boat. He had all these sayings. And, you know, as a kid, we wanted to be mad when we were treated like that. Um, but, yeah, from the time they were in high school, they were high school sweethearts. Um, he went into the Air Force at a very young age, right out of high school, and um, left her home. She, uh, they were engaged before she graduated from high school. And um, and that's when she got out of school and got a job. She had a job only for two years in her whole life. Right and that's after. where she met the man that and was your biological that's father. That's where she met him. He was 12 years older than her. Um, it was a name I'd never heard. I, I don't know. One of the things that um, drives me crazy is, did Dad know him? Because we lived in a small town, and he was not from that small town. He was actually from Albany. But Wait, the, the biological father? The biological father was, father was from Albany. Um, but in our small town, if, if mom knew somebody, dad would most likely know him too. I mean, that's Ooh. just the way it was. Everybody knew everybody. So um, it, that drives me crazy. Is this somebody dad knew? Um, and I can't find out the answer to that question. I did show a picture of him to my aunt, and she got this little smile on her face, and she said, I met that man, but she doesn't know where or when. Uh, she's sure she's seen him before. And he's dead now. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, he's gone. My Both of my parents are gone. So, Well, another part of the book is it centers, of course, on your father, but it's up on your own marriage. Can you just talk a little about oh. that? And- oh, yeah, that was great. <laughs> But you included it in the book, so it's part of the story. Um, I wanted badly to get out of my parents' house. When I was just about to graduate high school, I was trying to figure out what I was going to do with myself. And we didn't have any money for college. I was a very good student. Um, but college just didn't seem to be in the cards for me. So I I got a summer job and uh, took a test to get a job with the state. And uh, while I was waiting that summer, I, I met this guy. His name was Don um, at Snack Bar where I was working. And I ended up marrying him very quickly. I actually didn't even know him all that well. We went out on a couple of dates um, and he had a very fancy sports car. He had a very fancy sports car, and it was uh, the fourth one that he had. Apparently, I never saw any of the others. Um, his dad had been walking him to the store when he was eight years old. Um, they were hand in hand, walk crossing the street, and they got hit by a car. And his father was killed instantly, and Don was hurt quite badly and was in a coma for a little over a week, I believe. Um, but there was a big court settlement that was put in trust for Don. Uh, and when he turned 21, he collected. And this was all before I knew him. He started to spend money like crazy. Um, and just about the time I met him was about the same time the money ran out. Um, so, yes, he still had this Corvette when I met him. And it was pretty cool. I'd never seen anything quite like it before. Um, And also the way you describe his Italian family, and you contrast it with your family. You know, people all sort of talking at once and eating lots of pasta. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, he 
he came from this this big loud Italian family. Actually, he all of his siblings were half siblings. Um, there were he had five older half siblings. I had five younger. Um, but they were loud and boisterous, and they were always yelling at each other. And uh, I say in the book, I learned what all the Italian swear words were. <laughs> the good ones and the bad ones. <laughs> the good ones say. and the yeah. bad ones, yeah. Um, and, and to sit down at a meal. Um, it, it wasn't a, a good meal unless there was a good argument to go along with it. And it, a lot of that was very distressing to me because I'd never encountered anything like that. But they were never really mad at each other, which was, which was the odd part about it. It was just that the argument was, I don't know, it was almost like dinner entertainment. <laughs> well, yeah, it's just different families have it's different cultural worlds. Yep, yeah, yeah. Um, so they had some strange customs. They were very nice to me. Um, it was just a little, um, a little odd and a little difficult to get used to. Well, it sounded like the mother was really, you were the best thing that ever happened to her son. Oh, yeah, and, she was thrilled. Know. Well, he was 27 years old, and, and, you know, she was an Italian mama who thought he should be married. He should have a wife. And So you were 10 years younger. I was nine years younger, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then when you had children, did how how, it sounds just from the way you briefly mentioned it that you're a very dedicated mother. Mm -hmm. um, how did your own upbringing influence the way that you were a mother? Um, well, that showed up, I think, more after I decided to divorce him because then I was on my own. I was a single mom with four little kids. Uh, and all of the things that I had done to take care of my own siblings when I was younger, uh, I had to do all by myself. Um, so, yeah, it was it, having kids was not. Um, so, some people, when they grow up without siblings, um, when they have kids, it's a it's a big, huge change in their lives. But this was not a change in my life. I was always used to taking care of. Yeah, you were like the mother too. Yeah, a lot of, yeah. yeah. So, tell us about the book itself. Here it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's you can hold it in your hand, and it's got a great cover. There's. Um, like a background picture of a little child's hand holding a big man's hand. Mm -hmm. And then there's an inset with, I'm assuming it's a picture of your father and you. It is. Yeah. Yep. And like, what does it mean to you to, to have this in this form? Well, I'm, I'm a little used to it now, but when it first got published, which wasn't all that long ago, um, I, it was just such a thrill. I was... It was surreal. It was like, oh, my God, I wrote a book. <laughs> um, and who do you picture reading this book? Who, who, would, who would be your ideal audience if you... Oh, gee, I, I don't know. Um, just about anybody. Uh, it's, got, it's got so many different types of things in it. It's, you know, it's got small town America. It's got the, um, my, my emotionally abusive mother and my wonderful dad. And it's got, um, military references. Uh, the time he met Jimmy Doodle. Jimmy. Oh, that's fascinating. I'd never heard of a short a snort sh before. Tell us what that is. A short, <laughs> short snorter. I don't know if the short snorter was something that only the air force did, or if it was all, all branches of the military. Uh, but as they traveled around to different countries during World War II, they would collect a paper bill, money, uh, from from that country, and they would tape them all together to make a long string of them. Um, and when they would meet in a bar for drinks, the the guy that had the shortest string had to buy a snort for everybody, so they came to be called short snorters. Um, and they would get people to sign those bills for them. And so Dad's has Jimmy Doolittle's signature and on it. And you said you have that framed in I your do. house. I do. I so framed cool. it in UV protective, uh, I don't know if it's glass or some kind of, of plastic material, but I wanted to protect the signatures because <coughs> they are faded. Um, and you need a magnifying glass, but you can, you can see James Doolittle on there. Uh, but yeah, he wrote in, in dad's plane and I say dad's plane in quotes cause that's what he used to call it. My plane. Um, but he was a navigator. Yeah. Father. They got to, um, they got to talk to him and, um, and that was, 
that was quite a highlight for him. Yeah, Dad was one of the first radar specialists. Um, radar was brand new. Um, so, and I've actually got some some pictures at home. Uh, he, he had a whole folder full of military stuff and that show what the radar looked like on the screen. And, and he uh, had written his memoirs, too, so you had kind of a model there. He did, and I actually quote them several times Early uh, on, in this yeah. book. Yeah. Um, he. I also say that that may be one of the hints he gave me. I th think he gave me two hints during yes, my you lifetime. Yes, mentioned that at the end, and tell us about that. How that you like to solve puzzles? I in, do. I in... I always love to solve puzzles, and um, he wrote these memoirs over the period of probably about a year. He spent a lot of time looking things up and writing down dates and and about where he'd gone, what he'd done, uh, who he'd met, and then when he was all done, he asked me if I would proofread it. And then type it up, and that was on an old typewriter, <laughs> uh, so that he could put it into a binder. And and so I did. Dad was a good writer. I didn't really have to do very much, uh, and I didn't pay attention to any of the dates because I couldn't check those. Those 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 dates were in his head. Um, had I maybe paid more attention or asked some questions, I might have figured out that I couldn't possibly have been fathered by him because he was on the other side he, of the world he was he was not here but and and so did he give me that to do did he uh, instead of for instance one of my sisters why didn't he ask one of them to do it um, the two of you seem particularly close. well we were we were um but anyhow uh he he gave me that task and i did it and i never ever saw, saw. It, was, it was right there yeah it was right there. That I think it's true of a lot of the big things in all of our lives. The big the things can be right in front of you and you don't see them. Mm -hmm. But one one of the other things that puzzled me a little is it's such a tribute to your father, mm -hmm. not just to his military career, but to him as a human being, and yet you don't reveal his name. You use Jones. Right. Um, what was the decision there? What was Probably that? being overly cautious because I've never done this before. I've never written a book before. And I didn't know how any of the living people that are mentioned in this book were going to react. Uh, so I was very careful not to reveal our family name or the name of the town where we grew up. And I've changed the names of all the living individuals that are mentioned in the book. Now, maybe none of that was necessary, but it just made me feel better to do it that way. I didn't want anybody to come back to me and say, um, why did you write about this? Why did you? Uh, I, I guess I was just fearful of maybe some uh, some blowback from somebody. Not in, how, how has your family reacted? They must have read it. Actually, the ones that I've spoken to have loved it. Um, my aunt, the one that I refer to as the redhead, because mm -hmm. that's all my mother would call her, um, she called me two days ago, and she was actually crying on the phone. Oh, my. She She's said, the one that had dirt thrown yes, at her. Yes. And... She said, Carol, I loved your book. You did such a great job. And she said it brought back so many memories for me. Um, so, so far it's, it's all been good. Uh, I had one old classmate mate from high school call me somebody that I haven't spoken to in a very long time. And she wanted to tell me how much she liked it. And she also said, she remembered that incident about the accordion on stage where we switched, where uh, we we crossed hands, and I was playing his yes. keyboard, he was playing my keyboard. I loved that. She actually remembered that, and oh and she said, "I remember that." Uh, so that was fun too. Yeah. So. Well, our time has gone so fast. I wanted to mention you have an upcoming reading, don't you? Okay. I do. Uh, I'm going to do a reading and a book signing at the Altamont Library on Monday, May sixth. It's going to be from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. I hope everybody comes over. I'd love to say hi to everybody. I will have some books there to sell. And for people that might not know, the Altamont Library is right in the heart of the village, on the Village Green in the old train station. Mm -hmm. 
So do you have any closing thoughts for us? Any things we haven't touched on? There's so much. Uh, yeah, <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff in this book. Uh, Why don't we go out the way we came in? Could you read us a final passage? Oh, sure. That would be great. Sure. Uh, you've read the book. Would you prefer the one about... Um, Whichever the you prefer. Item? Okay, I'm going to read... Um, I have to find it here. I'm yeah, take sorry. your time. Okay. Our father had some unusual ways to get us to comply with his wishes. Patty and I often could not go to sleep until long after our lights were turned out. We amused ourselves by playing word or memory games or just chatting. Sometimes it went on for a long time, and Dad would yell up the stairs, Go to sleep, you two. One night, after we'd gone on ta talking and giggling for much too long, I heard a, a low growling noise coming from inside our room and said, Patty, knock it off. It wasn't me. Of course it was you. It wasn't me, and we're the only ones here. Again, a deep growl. Now I was worried. Patty, I said, knock it off. Before she could respond, it happened for the third time, and then Patty got scared. Carol, stop it. It's not funny. We both became quiet, listening but hearing nothing more. Suddenly, Dad stood up in the middle of our room between our two beds and said, Now be quiet and go to sleep. <laughs> then he walked out. He had silently crawled into our room on his hands and knees, and we'd been so busy chattering away that we'd not heard him. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you, Carol. Well, thank you so much.